Now what are these effects? It has been divided into biophysical, economic and social. Biophysical uh, refers to the degradation in the air quality, water quality, uh, noise levels. These are the some of the biophysical uh, impacts and then uh, it, uh, we have economic impacts which, which is also related to the uh, biophysical like when we have trade and commerce, forests, we use those resources and then finally social impacts we see in the form of health impacts uh, and which will also affect the biophysical and economic systems. Now we look at some of the environmental concerns in India. Okay, some, uh, some concerns are due to the negative effects of the process of development and the second is those arising from the condition of poverty and underdevelopment and uh, to add on to this we have high population increase will which will negate the uh, problem of the, uh, which will negate the developmental programs okay uh, we see over exploitation over grazing and encroachment encroachment unsustainable practices which leads to uh, environment degradation and we also have some development projects road construction power plants they are good for the development but they also harm our environment so we need sustainable development uh, there's loss of habitat uh, which leads to extinction of species and wetlands of india which are home to uh, birds animals okay which provide food, uh, uh, food and shelter and uh, these all leads to when we over exploit them this will add to our environmental concerns we also consume lot of products which are uh, non biodegradable okay uh, our economy has open and we have lot of opportunities for buying new products so some of them could be non biodegradable which will also affect the environment now we will try to understand sustainable development. Why there is a need of sustainable development? The doctrine of sustainability provides a mechanism uh, for development to occur in harmony which will protect our environment and enhancement. Okay? Uh, now uh, it should not cause no net environmental harms. Okay? We should remember this. It should not cause environmental harm and to preserve environmental resources for future generations. The key word is your, you should be you should preserve your resources for future generations. Now this has been defined as development that means the need of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. This was coined by Bratlet, she was a former Prime Minister of Norway and she coined this work uh, Sustainable Development. which are interlocking uh, social issues, economic and environment and sustainable development is at the center. So uh, sustainable development teaches us to respect and uh, we should inculcate uh, such practices which will have a harmony between social, economic and environment. That means we are developing on a sustainable basis. Now this is sustainable development comes from systems thinking. Okay, what is systems thinking? Uh, system thinking makes us that earth is, we have only one planet earth and we have finite resources. So we should use resources in a judicious way so that it is available for the future generation. Okay, uh, this teaches us to live in harmony with the nature. Okay, we have to adjust to the nature and not vice versa. This was uh, given in uh, the report, Caring for the Earth, a Strategy for Sustainable Living, which was published 
by three important uh, organization IUCN, UNEP and WWF. Why this uh, need? Uh, we should understand that even earth has some intrinsic values. Okay. So, regardless of whatever human beings are, so we should not go on consuming the resources. We should also think of the planet Earth, which has its own values. Okay, so that these uh, resources, biodiversity, gene pools, they will be available for us in future. Okay, and spiritual terms, it is living in harmony with the nature. Now, we should also understand two concepts. Precautionary principle and polluter-based principle. Okay, what is precautionary principle? Is that that environmental environmental impacts may be assumed to be serious. If you think a development project may have some serious implications on your health or the environment, but evidence is not available, you can stop that development till your facts are established through research, and then you can go ahead with that project. Okay. So this is called as the precautionary principle and polluter pays principle. This asserts that whoever is polluting, he is responsible and he should be penalized uh, for harm done to the environment. Now we look at some of the international initiatives which we have taken to protect the environment. Okay, the first important uh, conference, UN Conference of Human. Environmental in Stockholm. This was the most important conference which took place in 1972, which initiated many other uh, in, uh, other environmental protection uh, units and it, uh, international treaties and uh, regional obligations by European Economic Community have also helped. Uh, they have been proactive in environment protection. And after that, in 1992, we had UN conference on. Environmental and Development, UNCD, which took place in Rio de Janeiro. This is one of the landmark conference and it is also called as Earth Summit. It encompasses a wide range of uh, issues including sustainable development, biodiversity, forest conservation, climate change and poverty eradication. Now, uh, the what will be some of the major outcomes of this Earth Survey? Uh, they are Agenda 21, Commission on Sustainable Development, Earth Charter, Convention on Climate Change, Forest Agreement and Convention on Protecting Biodiversity. These were some of the important outcomes. Now what does Agenda 21 look after? It is an action plan for Sustainable development for the world in 21st century. Okay, and it stresses on fulfillment of the basic needs to all, improved living standards for all, better and protected management of ecosystem, and safe and prosperous future. Okay, then uh, there was a commission on sustainable development which was created in 1992 to ensure whatever. Uh, uh, issues were discussed in the Agenda 21 to monitor and report and implementation of the Earth Summit and agreements at local, national and international levels. So this commission will look after the implementation of the Earth Summit agreement and which is at global level, local, national, regional and international level. Now we look at some of the Indian initiatives. Okay, after the 1972 conference, there were in many countries the Indian themselves took some initiatives for the protection of the environment. Uh, our late Prime Minister Mrs. Indira Gandhi had attended the Stockholm conference, where uh, the developing country uh, people expressed that too much of development is. De degrading the environment. So they declared no growth policy but our Prime Minister did not agree to it. She said some of the problems in the developing countries are due to underdevelopment itself. Okay. So we need to, I mean she did not agree to this kind of policy and same view was shared by the all other uh, developing country states. Now we look at some of the Indian initiatives. 
Uh, first time after the UN Stockholm conference, the environment was integrated into the planning commission. So during fourth fire plan, that was during 1968 to 73, environment was integrated into the planning and development process. Post this, we had another committee, National Committee on Environment Planning and Coordination, which was set up in 72. Okay, this looked after and this was an apex advisory body which looked after the environmental issues. The only limitation was it didn't have any binding commitments. Okay, so to address that, uh, TYP committee was instituted uh, which also made recommendation for more administrative and legislative uh, uh, guidelines and rules. Okay, so on the recommendation of TYP committee, a separate department of environment was created in 1980 and this will be the center stage for planning, promoting and coordinating related to the environment. Okay? And subsequently we had full fledged Ministry of Environment and Forest under which we have Central Pollution Control Board and State Pollution. Now we look at some of the legislative measures. What were the legislative measures? Uh, earlier, we had only few acts, Wildlife Protection Act and Air Pollution uh, and Prevention uh, prevention and Control of Air Pollution. Then we had Water Pollution, Prevention and Control of Pollution Act. But there was few limitations. Uh, few of the cases were deviated and uh, they were not penalized. They thought, uh, it, was, it was observed that uh, the cases prolonged uh, and uh, we could not uh, penalize uh, those people uh, only because of only two acts, okay? And then um, Environment Protection Act was initiated, and this addressed most of our environmental problems. We also have Public Liability Insurance Act and National Environmental Tribunals Act. Now we look at ecosystem approach to environment management. Now, what is ecosystem approach? As I told you in the beginning, principles of environment management, uh, environment management can be done in three ways. One is your compartmental approaches. Compartment approach means you will just look at air pollution, water pollution, okay, noise pollution. And we have another approach which is called as ecosystem approach. Ecosystem approach is where every, we will uh, see like the way ecosystem functions. Everything is linked, one is linked to the other. So this comes from a, uh, uh, because uh, we can, uh, there are learning from the ecosystem where one uh, species influences the other. Okay. So what is ecosystem approach? A system with a set of link components where the linkages may be, not be, they may not be direct, but a network of web, just like in a ecosystem. Now attempt to over exploit we have resulted in the degradation of the ecosystem. So when uh, in the ecosystem approach we need systems diagram okay, where we um, link one to the another and where we analyze like a part to the whole okay, and we will through systems diagram we can see uh, which uh, factor is influencing and environmental degradation is taking place. But for that you have to continuously monitor natural systems as well as your anthropogenic system which is harming the environment. Now these are the elements of the ecosystem. Your ecosystem and human activities they are not in isolation. Okay, All of us are linked. Okay, Any uh, uh, degradation of the air quality will affect the ecosystem. Okay, So through system diagrams it will provide us a framework to address this issue. Now we come to more important point that is uh, we can also strengthen our uh, management system through uh, more legislations and public education program okay and creating environmental awareness. How to have a responsible behavior towards the environment can be done through public education and awareness campaign okay and 
will also look at some of the environmental management tools. Um, there have been many changing environmental uh, practices. Hmm? We will look at some of the important environmental management tools. All this decadal experience of protection for the environment and policy, they have led to a few environment management tools which will, uh, we will see how it helps us in managing environment and how we can have good decisions and improve our environmental performance. First environment management tool is environment impact assessment. What is EI? Anybody? And what is environmental impact assessment? Is to identify and evaluate potential benefits and adversities. Okay, so you will look at both positive and negative impacts of the development. Okay, it is a decision making tool. Okay, so if we have to take a decision whether this development project should be allowed or it should be restricted. Okay, at the planning stage itself, EI will be helpful in taking that decision. Environment impact assessment makes us accountable, accountable towards the environment from the initial stage itself. So, uh, some of the projects will have beneficial, that's why we have to be, because they provide employment opportunities, but it can also harm our environment. So, we should see at what extent uh, the project may be beneficial and harmful. So this is taken at planning stage. Uh, so how the EIA is done? First you look at the existing background pollution. Wherever your project has to, for example you are coming up with a power plant project. So wherever your uh, site is given. So first you will check the background levels. You will study a baseline uh, yes. environment quality. That will be with regard to your air, water noise levels, social land use pattern. So you will first study the base level and then you will look at the contribution of the pollutant from the proposed site. Okay, if the proposed project comes up and what, how it will impact the environment can be looked, uh, studied through EI. Okay, and then finally we prepare an environment management plan. Environment management plan, it will help to formulate then implement and monitoring of the environment protections, what measures should be taken after the commissioning of the project. Okay, once the project starts, before that our environment management plan should be ready. So to do EIA, we should refer environmental notification. There are guidelines given for which projects, uh, how the study has to be carried out. So this was the one of the important tool that is EIA. Now we go to another tool which is called as life cycle assessment. Okay, it is also known as life cycle analysis or grade to grade analysis. Okay, uh, this is a very important uh, tool. Here we try to understand the impacts right from the raw material extraction to product stage, manufacture use, and then finally when it is disposed. Okay, so we will study their impact at each stage. But uh, we will see what are the impacts during raw material extraction. If you are mining some uh, uh, minerals, what could be the impact? And then during the production stage, what kind of a pro process it is, whether it is a green process, how much energy is consumed. And during use stage, how we are using. For example, if you have a washing machine, Okay, you consume lot of water and energy during your use stage. So you will through life cycle analysis, you will try to minimize the impact at various stages. They have given example life cycle analysis of a t-shirt. We will start right from where the raw material extracted or uh, if we have to, how it was grown, if we require, like if we use cotton then how it was, how much fertilizers it was used, what impact it had and then in process, which kind of process okay, and how much water was consumed, energy was consumed and finally use state, how much detergent you use and if you recycle or reuse that t-shirt, even that impact is studied. Okay. 
Okay, this is done through life cycle analysis. Now we come to another uh, important tool that is called design for environment. Okay, DFE. Design for environment is an umbrella term used to incorporate environmental components into products and services before the production phase. Okay, in life cycle analysis, at each stage we were studying in design for environment. We will design the product itself so that it has minimum impacts. Okay, that's why uh, the key word is before they enter the production phase. Okay, and this seeks to innovate the product so that it is environmentally friendly as well as it the economical yields. Okay, even cost wise, uh, we'll see the cost of the product and we will also look at the environmental impacts. So DFE and LCA can be complementary. Okay, so if you you through DFE you can uh, study and uh, you can uh, um, I mean you can uh, suggest some uh, changes at the production stages. Now, what are the uh, some of the DFE practices? One is designing for recycling. Okay, you design your uh, product. So that it can be used for recycling. Okay, then design for disassembly. Okay, how we will dismantle and some of the components can be used back. Okay, so your designing should be designed for disassembly. The next one is how energy efficient your product is, and design for remanufacture and disposability. We look at some of the examples. To understand this, and if you think some of your product is non-biodegradable or which is hazardous, you can substitute or you can minimize uh, that material. Okay, so this uh, design also plays in the crucial role in preparing environmentally responsible products. So what we observe here, the packaging has been reduced. Okay. So this is at the design stage itself. You are designed so that your packaging waste will be reduced. Here, what we see, design for disassembly. Okay. So here it takes 30 minutes, and here we have 30 seconds. Some of the parts uh, from a television set can be recovered. Okay. So design for this disassembly. Here we see example mono material. Okay, you will see a single type of a material which is used so that that packaging can also be recycled. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here modular type. Okay, so it is folded and here again the packaging is reduced. So mo modular type of product can also be designed. There are few more examples. Here you can see the plush. Uh, the water which is used in the sea can also go for flushing. So these are some of the innovative ideas and it is also environment friendly because the resource, water resources can be conserved and utilized. Okay. Here we have a, usually we have a coca cola can which is colored. Okay. So here we see a single, so this was the red color which we see, it has some heavy metals and uh, while Spray painting, lot of air emissions uh, are released, so that can be avoided, and this also helps when you are recycling. Okay, the burden of removing that color uh, is reduced. So this helps when when we in the workplace environment when we have such kind of air emissions, it also impacts the um, health of the worker. So it helps in if we we have these kind of designs, it will also help in. Improving the health of that worker as well as the productivity. Okay. Now here we can use some recycled uh, products which we already use. Some of our books are from the recycled paper. So the design of uh, design for the environment makes us aware of all environmentally responsible products. Now we look at and what is the plastic bottle? These are the pet bottles which can be recycled. Where it has virgin uh, material. Okay, 
So that uh, burden will be reduced when you are making another uh, plastic bottle, another pet bottle. Okay, so this, you can see pellets over here. Yeah. So it can be again used in your for uh, manufacturing bottles. Now we will look at another tool, environmental audit. Before this, we discuss which tools. How does life cycle analysis help us? It examines every step of the way. From the raw material to the steps of taking more energy or more consumption, we can reduce it with positive. Correct. So we have discussed three uh, environmental impact assessment, life cycle analysis, design. So we have another tool. Environmental audit. Okay. So, what is environmental audit? This is internal verification proce uh, procedure which compares results with expectations. Okay. You have some norms, guidelines, the way it has to be operated. So, when we audit, we can check whether it is functioning as per those norms or guidelines. Okay. Environmental audit will help us to uh, look at any uh, any um, if there is any problem in the functioning of the system or if uh, a process is not working as per the norms, it will help us to assess and rectify. Okay, so it checks the competence, performance, and effectiveness of those systems and practices. Okay, and this audits can be done at uh, internally and uh, if uh, your company can be audited by the external or third party. It's a management tool. Uh, there's a background to the environmental audit. There was a key on case uh, in US, uh, in the United Nations, where the Allied Chemical Company had to pay a lot of penalties. And post that, uh, United States Environment Protection Agency, they started the auditing process. Okay, and uh, environmental audit is also uh, um, shows the uh, if through environmental audit we can also improve our environmental performance. And it also helps us to keep our checks in system so that we don't have, I mean if we exceed the standards or we violate the standards then we will have to pay heavy penalties. So before that environmental audit can help us. And it is response to greater public and business awareness. We have, uh, we have seen uh, the Bhopal gas tra tragedy. If they could have audited their systems, they could have seen what were the problems in the plant and they could have rectified. So through audit, uh, we can assess our safety measures. Okay, We can look at our safety measures and whether they are functioning as per the uh, factory diet rules and guidelines. It is defined as systematic, documented, periodic and objective re review by regulated ent entities of those facility or we can also uh, do an audit by a third party. Okay? So we will prepare a checklist whether they are functioning and then we can say the audit was satisfactory. Now we come to another and very important tool, environment management systems. Okay? Um, there is an organization called International Organization for Standardization. That is ISO. It has, it's a voluntary organization. It has many standards. Okay, there are standards for energy. There are standards for quality systems. They also have standards for environmental, environmental management. Okay, which is called, um, which is called as environment management systems. And the standard required is ISO fourteen thousand one. Okay. There is a difference between ISO 14000 and 14001. Under ISO 14000, we have list of standards. Okay, the list of standards provided and guidelines given how to perform an uh, uh, life cycle assessment, how to give environmental labels, okay, and uh, how to do auditing. All the guidelines are provided. Whereas ISO 14001 is a certification standard. Okay, you have to undergo a process where you will be certified as ISO 14001 company. Okay, you will be called as ISO 14001 and not ISO 14000. ISO 14000 is list of standards. Okay, 
So what is environment management systems? This is another tool which helps to improve your environmental performance. Okay, and this is a voluntary initiative. It's not mandatory uh, for you. It's a voluntary initiative. Um, there's a lot of competition uh, today, and there's a lot of pressure. Okay, even green consumers. We, uh, now we are very much empowered, you know, to buy which kind of product. Some people they don't buy batteries produced by Union Carbide. So we are green consumerism. Okay, and there is a lot of competition, and always we have resource crunch or some international initiatives where uh, to protect ozone layer. Some com uh, some compounds were born, uh, banned. Okay, ozone depleting substances were banned. So there are some. Uh, initiatives which will uh, have uh, a taboo on your how, how you are performing or how you are uh, improving your environmental performance. So this environmental management system, if you are certified, it gives a credibility to your company. Okay, and uh, it improves your brand image. Okay, and through adhering to the environment uh, protection, we also have profits. Okay. So environment management is a set of process and practice that enable an organization to reduce its impact and increase its operating efficiency. As I told you, the driving forces are self regulations Okay, it's not mandatory. Increasing competition, international agreements, your green consumer, and stricter environmental laws and regulations. Now, how is this uh, approach of uh, ISO 14001? You see, this model, this model uh, is given by Deming, proactive model. It was given by very famous statistician uh, Deming. Here we have a reactive model which says wait. Okay, if you have to do something for the environment, reactive model is saying wait, identify, and react. This is a reactive. And this is a proactive model where we say plan, do, check, act. This is called as PDCA cycle, which which is first under uh, PDCA cycle you have plan, okay, where you have an environmental policy, where you are committing yourself to do uh, something for the environment, okay, where you define your objectives and target and this policy is signed by the top management okay it is not the responsibility of environment manager it is it comes through uh, top management your top management your ceo of the company will sign that environment policy you plan you form your objectives and target and then you do okay you execute you implement what are your uh, whatever uh, how the way you are going to improve your environmental performance and then you check whether your system is functioning that is through environmental audit, audit. we discussed audit mm -hmm. so you can check the performance and then finally you will review ok so this is the process of um, ISO 40001 which is a proactive approach and this is Continual improvement. It doesn't end. If we form a policy, we do auditing, we check, we review, and it doesn't get over. Okay. This continuously we will work upon. We will uh, revise and we will improve the environmental performance. Okay. This is the uh, most important environment management tool, which is practiced, especially it is pra uh, practiced in the industries. So we look at some of the environment management practices. In the 60s, we had uh, this impression that dilution is solution to pollution. Okay, but that was not the correct concept. Then we came to end of the pipe treatment in 70s, where we started constructing effluent treatment plants and air pollution control equipments. And then we came to 80s and 90s, where we had Pollution prevention and cleaner production methods, okay, which will put less burden on the environment. We were preventing, okay, here we were treating at the end, but later we tried some concepts like uh, cleaner production where we are 
reducing in the production state itself. And then came environment management systems which also helps to improve your environmental performance. And then we have tools like LCA, environmental <laughs> design which is uh, which are being uh, currently practiced. So what we learned in this unit about principles of the environment management, what were the concerns in India and what were some of the initiatives which led to the protection of the environment in India as well as international. And then finally we looked at environment management tools. Okay, they are the uh, they are most useful for the management of the environment. So we have looked at life cycle analysis, EIA, environmental auditing, environmental design. So these are the various tools currently practiced. So environment management will lead to reduce cost, better image, get less reduced risk, and you will improve your environmental performance. Okay. So you are using a lot of fruits in the basket. If you if you everything is intact, your basket will be full of fruits. The uh, reference for this unit is uh, taken from uh, common bank modules, which is uh, written by Vijay Kulkarni and T V Ramchandra. It's a Terry publication. And finally, take home message. Uh, the fundamental duty of every citizen is to protect and improve the natural environment including forests, lakes, rivers and wildlife and above all to have ecological compassion. This is our fundamental duty. I mean it is our duty to protect. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.